Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pastor Al Persson. I'm going to be talking to you today from Isaiah 45. I'm going to follow on from our two messages from last week about the Jesus prayers that appear in the New Testament. First of all, a little bit about me. I'm the minister of a uh, small church, but a happy church in uh, East Lakes, New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. My email address is pastor at mascot.church. You can contact me or leave comments below once the comments are turned on uh, against this video. First, a little bit of an historical backdrop is going to be necessary for this to happen. The uh, children of Israel in the Bible were taken into captivity, the northern ten tribes, by the Assyrians, the southern two tribes later on by the, uh, uh, by the Babylonians and the Babylonians also had then overcome Assyria in battle. At the end of the Babylonian Empire, the Medes and the Persians took over and governed the whole region and Israel was under the grip or under the control of the, uh, the Medo-Persian Empire. You might have heard the amazing phrase, uh, the writing is on the wall or the handwriting is on the wall or wherever, and you say, where did that come from? That comes from the Bible, the book of Daniel, at the end of the Babylonian Empire and the beginning of the Persian Empire that God wrote on the wall uh, to the king of Babylon at the time and said, your time is up. Well, Babylon was a mighty and magnificent city. It required or used water from the Euphrates River to keep it, uh, to provide its water and uh, for cleaning and so on. And the Medes and the Persians, a growing empire, in order to take the city, needed to get into the city. So what they did way upstream was diverted the Euphrates, the rivers of the Euphrates. They diverted the Euphrates River. You can read about this, just look it up historically. Uh, look it up in history sites on the, on the internet. And it would mean that as the river levels dropped or fell, they would be able to, to starve out the city or whatever. When they actually got to the city, it was Cyrus who led the battle, apparently. When they got to the city, they um, found that the gates, which are brass gates, actually wooden gates covered in brass, probably, the commentators say, hadn't been all properly closed. So basically, the uh, Medes and the Persians, the rode straight into Babylon and overcame, took the city, killed the king, and took the wealth of the riches. The principal player in, amongst the Medo-Persians was a man, a king named Cyrus. And Cyrus was uh, a, uh, was from Persia. He, he is a bit confused sometimes with the king named Dar Darius. And King Darius appears in the book of Daniel immediately after that. In fact, there is uh, such a dispute about Cyrus and Darius, whether they are one person uh, or whether they're co-regents or whatever. In fact, but a bit of a funny story. I rang the, um, we have this historian comes on the radio from time to time and I was listening in the car and he said, and he's a historian about, he specializes in that type of, of um, that timeline. And I rang him, I, they put me on and I said, listen, what, were these two kings well known in history, Cyrus and Darius, were they two kings? Or were they um, co-regents, or were they one king with two different names, depending on the rhetoric, on the on the story, or uh, or whatever? And he said to me, "Well, he said you've asked a question I cannot answer, and because of that, I got the question of the day." And he sent me a great book as a as a gift. So some of these are really difficult questions to to get answers to. We do know, however, that there was at least King Cyrus in the mix. So. Uh, the amazing part of this story is that many years before Cyrus was born, the prophet Isaiah named him and described what his entry into Babylon would be like. Now what this says to you and to me is that God is above time. Now initially people said, oh, that text in the book of Isaiah was added later on. Well, that's, no one believes that anymore. Well, very, very few. They all understand this was written well before the time of Cyrus. Imagine that you perform some great act and somebody hands you a piece of paper, a document that was written a hundred years before your birth that names you and describes your act. Wow. Now, 
This comes from, or the story, the core part of this story in the book of Isaiah is from Isaiah chapter 45. Okay, so Isaiah was one of the great prophets of Israel. I'm actually going to have to read this passage to you. There's not going to be an easy way to cherry pick it. It is a fantastic passage. Now, when I go into the screens, you're going to notice that I've, I have uh, changed the the text to be centered and some lines are highlighted and I'll try to mark them in case you're just listening and not able to view this uh, but there are some important lines that I think you need to pay attention to because we're basically this is a follow-on from last week's talk about the Jesus hymns that appear in the New Testament so just for uh, just for review the two hymns we're actually going to talk about that appear in the New Testament are in Colossians chapter 1 and Philippians chapter 2. We'll come back to these in just a moment. Now, please allow me the, to read to you from Isaiah, all of Isaiah 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes and secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you though you do not know me. Now note, note that I've highlighted, underlined verse 5 here. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, the people may know from the rising of, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open that salvation and righteousness may, may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among the earthen pot, among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it? What are you making? Or your work has no handles. Woe to him who says to, to a father, you are, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, with what are you in labor? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, the one who formed him. Ask of me things to come. Will you command my, me concerning my children and the work of my hands? I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens, and I commanded all their host. I have stirred him up in righteousness, and I will make all his ways level. He shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts, the Lord, the only Savior. Thus says the Lord, the wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabaeans, men of stature, will come over to you and be yours. They shall follow you. They shall come over in chains and bow down to you. They will plead with you, saying, Surely God is in you, and there is no other, no God beside him. Truly you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel, the Savior. All of them are put to shame and confounded. The makers of idols go, to in, go in confusion together. But Israel is saved by the Lord with everlasting salvation. You shall not be put to shame or confounded to all eternity. Okay, almost finished here. Verse 20 continued, who carry out their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Verse 21, declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who, who told this? I'm going to change this again. Let me read it correctly. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God beside me, a righteous God and Savior. There is none beside me. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, as there is no, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word shall, that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength, to him shall come and be ashamed, all who are incensed against him. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. 
You've heard me say this, ladies and gentlemen, there is so much to this passage. You've heard me say it, even when I'm just talking about just a little passage, I'm thinking, and I say, oh, if only we could spend the time to plumb the depths of this text. If, if only, if only, if only. Well, we don't have that time together. This is the wonderful world of the internet. We have a few minutes, and uh, next thing you know, we're off back at work and so on. But maybe this has stimulated you to look at Isaiah 45 and do some homework and do some more reading on this passage. So first of all, God has, uh, in Isaiah 45, God has uh, named Cyrus. We know from the last bit, uh, the end of uh, the book of um, Chronicles and the beginning of the book of Ezra, that Cyrus began to follow the God of Israel. Now, there are some interesting texts, some interesting, goodness gracious me, a couple of statements in this passage I want to draw your attention to. First of all, Cyrus believed in, in his belief system that uh, good and evil were equally balanced in the universe and that they're in a constant kind of yin-yang struggle. So Cyrus would be what you'd call a dualist, did not believe in a monotheist, was, did not have a monotheist position. That is a position that, like us that holds one God. Now, as Trinitarians, we say one God in three persons, but uh, Cyrus did not hold to that position uh, at all. So this is why God says, well, listen, whatever happens, whether it's good or whether it's bad, I'm the one who takes charge of these things. He said, I make it, I create it. Now that reference about creating calamity is probably a reference to creating wars that God actually ordained Cyrus to go and fight in those wars. You'll also notice in the passage that the scripture says that Cyrus would be given the, the hidden uh, treasures of the time. The value that Cyrus carried away in gold, I was reading commentators on this, trying to get sort of an, an understanding, from one kingdom alone uh, in 1960 money, I was alive in the 60s, don't remember the 60s, I was just a baby, but uh, in 1960s money was $630 million worth of gold. So estimated multiple billions of dollars worth of gold from just one of the many kingdoms that he took. And so Cyrus was wealthy, he was extremely powerful, a brilliant military tactician. And so, and God explains some things about himself to Cyrus, but he also says, listen, he says, your, your gods, and he, he, this is all really coming on from the chapter before, your, your gods, the gods of the world are dumb, that they can't talk about the future. And he said, but who was it who, who wrote this Cyrus? Who was it who said, these things are going to happen? Who was it all the way in the past who now has named you and said these things? This is a very strong case for God knowing the future. It's important for you and for me to understand that before you and I were born, God knew you and your name. God does not, um, God knows everything, okay? So, uh, and he makes, and really this is one of those passages we use to demonstrate God's authority over time. So he's going to Cyrus and he says, listen, he said, I, th there isn't anybody else like me. I am the Lord, there is no other. No one is coming to challenge me. Said, you, you look at the weather, I create it. You look at the thing, I create it. You, I create you. I knew you. I knew you before you were even born. I set this whole thing up. So if you want to read Cyrus' um, commentary and his own reaction, go to the last book, of, the last chapter of the book of Chronicles and read that entirely in the first chapter of the book of Ezra and you will get Cyrus' decree. How did Cyrus, what else was Cyrus done? Why else is he famous or important? Well, you might remember me saying, and I think I noted earlier on, that the Jews were in captivity. They'd been under the control of the Babylonians, the, the, northern, the ten northern tribes under the Assyrians. The Assyrians were defeated, then the two southern tribes under the Babylonians. Cyrus comes along, and Cyrus releases them to go back and to build the temple and return to their land. So he's considered a great friend of the Jews and a great friend of Israel, and this was all part of God's plan. They would return to the land, and they would provide the environment where the Lord Jesus Christ would be born, the prophets would continue to minister. This time when Israel was away, was not in the land, was called the exile. So sometimes if you're looking in scripture, you'll find prophets who are pre-exilic, that is before the exile, and you'll find prophets who are in the exile, like Daniel and Ezekiel, and you'll find prophets who are post-exilic. Malachi was one, and there's some 
post-exilic um, statements and writings in the scripture. So this is uh, important to do if you're going to try to get a broader picture of what's going on here. Okay. Now, what's really interesting is that God speaks of himself in a very monotheistic way. I am the Lord, there's none other. There's no one beside me. Okay. So if this is a strong revelation of him. Now, did I not say to you, I believe I certainly said to you that today's message is a continuation from last week's message. So you look at all of those places where God speaks about who he is and that he is alone. If you don't mind, I'm going to flick back to these just quickly on the screen and just highlight them in case they've slipped from your mind here. So I'll go straight back up to uh, verse 5. I am the Lord... And there is no other beside me. There is no God. Down to verse 6. I am the Lord. There is no other. Uh, and down to the end of verse 13. Says the Lord of hosts. The Lord. The only Savior. And then down here in the uh, middle. The end of verse 14. Surely God is in you. There is no other. No gods beside him. Verse 21, the end, there is no other God beside me, a righteous God and Savior. Verse 22, for I am God, there is no other. And a very important passage down here in verse 23, to me, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. This is extremely interesting because this phrase comes up in our Jesus prayers from last week, or our Jesus hymns from last week. What was that about? Well, in the New Testament, in the New Testament, there are at least three uh, hymns that were, or creeds or confessions, that were used by early Christians to help them remember who Jesus Christ was and help them to teach who Christ what is, was, I mean, it was in their memory some knew him uh, in his earthly ministry, but who he is. And those then were incorporated into New Testament texts. Well, what's really interesting is that some of these New Testament texts quote, one of them quotes Isaiah 45. Now, the one I'm going to put up here does not, yet we are just going to review it very, very quickly because it's kind of relevant. In Colossians, that is the letter to the church at Colossae written by the Apostle Paul. This is from what is believed to be a Jesus hymn. It's chiastically organized. Look at the video from last week if you want to see what that means. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning. He's the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to, recognize, to reconcile all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is really interesting because claims are made of the Lord Jesus Christ that God makes of himself in Isaiah 45 and other places. God says, I'm the only Savior. Well, hang on now. How can he be the only Savior? Let Jesus be the Savior, as we just read. How can he be the Creator and Jesus be the Creator? Well, I don't, don't understand. The mystery and the magic and the wonder of the doctrine of the Trinity, ladies and gentlemen. But you'll notice that the divine qualities that God claims for himself are assigned to the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Colossians in that particular prayer. Now, the one we want to spend a bit more time on today, or just reference as we end, is from Philippians, and it is this one, Philippians 2.15. I'm using all my references are from the English Standard Version at the moment. Here we go. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? 
In Isaiah 45, God says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Every knee will bow to me and show me authority. And here in Philippians chapter 2, we see of the Lord Jesus Christ that every knee will bow and confess him as Lord. What does that mean? Well, I'm not entirely sure, but I'm going to guess this. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Hmm. I would rather bow my knee to him now than then, if that's a correct interpretation of that passage. Something else in the last passage that's also interesting. You may be aware that the Jews held the name of God with such reverence that they did not pronounce it or speak it. It was the name above all names, probably Yahweh or Yahweh is the pronunciation of the name of God that probably hasn't ever been lost. Uh, I'll say that again, probably we in the West don't use the guttural sound, so Yahweh, but more than likely Yahweh. The, it would, be, would have been the name of God or something close to that. Well, what does it say about the Lord Jesus Christ? He has been given a name above every name. So he's been given the highest name as well. Well, there's no higher name than Yahweh, but um, you'll note that he is given a divine name, the divine name. So we see a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ as God. Now the New Testament reveals him as God. Jesus said in the book of John, if you do not believe that I am, that is the I am who appeared to Abraham, you will die in your sins. Part of becoming a Christian and a believer is understanding that the Lord Jesus Christ is God, or that Jesus Christ is Lord, he is God, and that he died in our place, that he saved us and has, uh, and has redeemed us, has paid the price for us. So here is a quick overview. Man, I got a lot of stuff in. How many minutes? 21 minutes, not doing too bad. Here's a very quick overview of uh, Cyrus the Great, the uh, Persian king, a question about Cyrus and Darius, or Darius who appears in the book of Daniel later on, and uh, a look at the fall of Babylon, the origin of the phrase, the handwriting on the wall. When they say the handwriting's on the wall, they're quoting scripture. Yeah, I've sometimes met people who just reject God outright. They use the handwriting's on the wall. Hey, where'd you get that from? I didn't know you read the Bible. And maybe they didn't, they heard it somebody else say it. A, a quick look at Isaiah 45, Go back and read this passage, spend some time. It is magnificent. God challenging Cyrus saying, Look, there, aren't, there isn't an equal good or bad, I'm responsible for everything. I am God, and that's a wonderful revelation. And he, he speaks about his deity, about the fact that he stands alone, that he is God. Yet in the New Testament, we find out that Jesus Christ is also God. How can that be? One God, three persons, the doctor of the Trinity, Going to have to do some videos on that to clarify that. For the moment, though, I am out of town. I, I'm out of town. Nope, I'm out of time. I hope that you uh, enjoyed today's presentation, and I hope to be back next week. Now, we are not locked down anymore, but I still want to continue to do this and hope that it blesses you. God bless you. My name is Al Person. My email address is pastor at mascot.com church. Talk soon.